Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. learners to the session of managerial economics. Let us look at the topics we have covered in our previous session. In our previous session, we have talked about elasticity. Elasticity is one thing which help you to understand the change taken place uh, or the change taken place in the quantity demanded due to the change in the factors affecting the demand. So, in detail we have talked about that concept. And we have also discussed about the different types of elasticity and majorly we have discussed price elasticity, income elasticity and cross elasticity because these are the factors which affect the demand of any commodity mostly. So, in price elasticity we have discussed what it is and here we have uh, understood the effect of price on the quantity demanded, how much change taken place in the quantity demanded due to the change in the price keeping other factors to be constant. And thereafter we have seen that there are different types of price elasticities as well because we have different nature of commodities and price will have different kind of effect on those commodities. We have highly elastic demand, highly inelastic demand, perfectly elastic demand, perfectly inelastic demand and unitary elastic demand. So, these are the 5 degrees of price elasticities which were discussed. We have also talked about the methods of collecting the price elasticity like percentage method, arc elasticity method and total outlay method. Thereafter, we have also looked at the implication why, why it is important for us to calculate the price elasticity and what help it is going to provide us in making various decision. Thereafter, we have talked about the income elasticity and here we have seen what change taken place in the quantity demanded due to the change in the income of a consumer. Usually, we say that when an income of a consumer increases, it is uh, demand of a commodity increases, but again income also have a different kind of impact on different commodities. Say for the natural goods, whenever the income of consumer increases, the demand for these goods also increases those uh, with goods which are of normal nature. Whereas in case of luxurious goods, uh, the demand also increases uh, whenever the income of the consumer increases, but in the case of inferior goods, whenever the income of the consumer increases, demand for inferior goods will decrease, right. And we have also talked about the study made by the Ernest Angel, uh, where he has established the relationship between the income and the consumption pattern of different commodities like necessary goods, normal goods and inferior goods. And we have also discussed the implication of income elasticity, how income elasticity will help the firms to find out what impact will take place in the demand of their commodity whenever there will be uh, you know change taking place at economic level, whether the economy is growing or economy is going downward. And lastly, we have talked about the cross elasticity. This is the third type of uh, you know elasticity of demand where we have established the relationship between the price of one commodity and how it will get uh, impact the demand of another commodity. Okay. So, here we have seen that in case of substitute goods cross elasticity will be positive because in this case when price of one commodity increases the demand for the other good will also increase. Whereas, in case of complementary goods here there is a negative relationship because these are the goods which are demanded jointly and when price of one commodity increases the demand for another good will decrease. And lastly we have talked about the price elasticity of supply. Price elasticity of supply states that keeping other factor constant here we measure the change in the quantity supplied due to the change in the price. And as we all know price is positively related in case of supply. So, here in this whatever the measurement you are going to get your answer will be positive. One thing which you need to remember while calculating the price elasticity, 
your answer will always be in negative because there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So, we usually ignore this sign because uh, th that will be there, but if we are not going to ignore it, we would not be able to find out the change in the degrees uh, like we have uh, you know elasticity greater than 1 also, elasticity equals to 1 and then elasticity equals to infinity also. So, in that case it will be difficult for us to which degree it is going to belong. Now, let us look at the learning objectives of our today's session. In today's session, we are going to uh, discuss the demand forecasting, right. As we all know demand, what demand is and now in this, we are going to introduce you with the topic of demand forecasting, how we can forecast the demand for the commodity because how much to produce, right. What to produce, we will be able to find out the answer of this question to look at the demand, the present demand in the market, but how much we are going to produce. For that, it is very important to know your demand in advance, right. Secondly, here in this, you will be able to understand the different types of demand forecasting, what are the different type of, uh, you know, diff methods are there through which we can forecast the demand. We will also explore qualitative as well as quantitative methods of demand forecasting and you will be able to get to know the limitations of demand forecasting while forecasting the demand what problems we come across. So, those limitations will also be discussed in this lecture. So, let us start with demand forecasting. What is meant by demand forecasting, right? Looking at the name of this particular word, you will be able to understand demand you already know. Demand becomes effective only when a person is having a desire and a willingness and ability to pay for it and forecasting refers to know the future demand of your product, right. So, demand forecasting is basically the tool to scientifically predict the likely demand of a product in the future, right. What will be the demand of your product in the future that you actually try to find out with the help of demand forecasting. So, here we have a definition given by American Marketing Association and they define demand forecasting is an estimate of sales in dollars or physical unit that uh, really matters to you how you are calculating it. you are calculating it in terms of money or you are calculating in physical uh, units which you are going to prepare for the specified period under the proposed marketing plan right whatever the planning you have done for your business you are trying to forecast the demand of that period which is known to as demand forecasting moving ahead uh, demand forecasting is done on different categorization, ok. So, here we have uh, written three bases on which we are going to categorize before we go for the forecasting of our demand, we, know, we need to know on what basis are we going to uh, start our forecasting with, right. So, here we have three things uh, through which we are going to understand the demand forecasting concept that what level of forecasting we are doing for which period of time we are focusing for forecasting of demand and for what nature of goods we are forecasting, right. So, these are the important factors you can say which you should be aware of before you start with demand forecasting. So, let us talk about the level of forecasting first, right. So, here we have classified the levels into three categories. You can also forecast the demand of your commodity at firm level, right, you, you as an individual person, right who is focusing for your individual firm would like to know what will be the demand of your product because accordingly you can make your decisions regarding the production as well as marketing, right. So, how you are going to produce, how much you are going to produce, what will be the future demand of your product. So, you can also focus the demand for the firm level that is for your specific firm, right. Then the forecasting can be done for the industry level also, right. Firms the group of firms working in a same product line comprises a, a industry, right. So, demand forecasting can be done for the particular industry also and this will provide the insight into the growth pattern of the industry, how the industry is growing, right. Everybody, uh, you know, liking the product which has been produced by the industry, right. It is also helpful in identifying the life stages of the product, at what stage your product is. Every product has a life cycle, right. So, starting from the introductory phase to the declining phase. So, at what uh, phase your, uh, you know, product is, at what stage your product is, that you will also be able to understand with the help of demand forecasting. And finally, uh, demand forecasting will also help you to, con uh, to find out the relative contribution of the industry in the national income, because national income is what? 
the production which is been made by the uh, you know firms and the industry right on the basis of that we calculate the national income right so how much uh, you know uh, input has been given by that particular industry for the contribution of national income that can also be calculated right even the demand can be forecasted at economy level you can also forecast the demand for your economy right aggregate demand of your economy and that usually been done by the government because they have to take various decision they have to frame out various policies for that economic level demand forecasting can also be made so this is one thing which you need to make yourself clear with at what level you are forecasting the demand and accordingly you are going to choose your method accordingly you are going to start with your uh, you know techniques whatever you are going to select right the next things which you need to make yourself clear with are you forecasting the demand for the shorter period of time or you are forecasting demand of your product for a longer period of time right so that uh, thing has to be very much clear in your mind short term basically focus on such forecasting to avoid uh, you know over as well as under production why are we forecasting because we want to know the exact demand of our product right if we are not forecasting the demand then we will have to face a problem of over and under production and both situation will be uh, you know a problem to us right if we are producing more than the required then uh, that is again a loss because we are involving our capital necessary we are blocking our capital and if the item is of perishable nature then again we have to uh, you know uh, uh, make extra effort to to you know uh, protect that uh, good right or maybe that product will go waste so uh, that is not a right way of production so we need to avoid the situation of over production as well as under production because if you are having the demand and you are not producing as per the demand that means you are making your loss so forecasting is again very important so that you can produce according to the demand in the market and save yourself over the situation of from the situation of over and under production secondly forecasting also help you in making the decisions regarding the inventory how much inventory you need for the production how much cost you are going to incur on your variable factors what will be your sales target and how are you going to price your product appropriately because ultimately all these things will based on the demand of your product in the market right and if you are forecasting the demand for the longer period so your focus will be different because longer period usually is more than 5 years or maybe 3 years right so that depends upon the forecasting what uh, you know a uh, time period you are keeping into consideration before moving ahead you have to keep your focus accordingly because usually long term forecasting focus on decisions like increasing the capacity of your production or maybe if the demand is not much then you can also plan of reducing your capacity and you can start your production into a different product you want to make a decision of uh, introducing a new plant or you want to introduce a new product to your uh, business line or you want to increase the product range right you want to get into a wider product range so all these things will be forecasted for a longer period of time looking at the trend and the market uh, you know conditions right it is also helping you in manpower planning like in future how many people you want to uh, in include in your business because these are the factors which cannot be changed overnight right so these are the things which takes considerable time so for that long uh, long term forecasting need to be done right how much capital is been required how investment decisions are to be taken up so all these things has to be taken care of uh, while forecasting the demand and lastly the categorization also been done on the nature of good right for what product are you forecasting the demand whether the product is a consumer good or it is a capital good because your categorization will be different right for the consumer goods you are going to find out the demand from the consumers because those people will be able to give you a better uh, you know informations regarding the demand of that commodity whereas capital goods if you are focusing on the demand of the capital goods that again your target people will be different for the, for that you need to find out the demand from the producers right because they would be needing uh, this capital good okay so the focus will be different your target audience will be different right and usually for the consumer goods we know we have two categories of good 
uh, we have durable consumer goods and we have non durable consumer goods right durable consumer goods are those goods which can be used for the longer period of time and for this purpose we usually take uh, those methods into consideration which focus on long term forecasting whereas durable goods are those goods which we demand again and again which are of recurring nature so usually we uh, you know use uh, those methods which helps you to forecast your demand in the shorter period of time and these durable goods will have a considerable effect because of change in the income level of the people or maybe because of their social status the sex of the people age as well as their education their occupation level right so there are different factors which affects the demand of non durable uh, consumer goods right let us move to the next heading where we are going to study the significance right these are the categorization which we have made before we go ahead with the demand forecasting we should be very much clear like for what level we are forecasting the demand are we forecasting the demand at individual firm level or industry level or at economy level so that focus will be changed and accordingly your method will be different right secondly we have seen the categorization made on the basis of time are we forecasting the demand for a product for a shorter period of time or for a longer period of time because again the orientation will be different and then the third categorization we have done on the basis of nature of the commodity whether we are forecasting the demand for the consumer good or for the capital good right now let us look at the significance significance means importance right why it is important okay what help it is going to provide us whatever the forecasting we are making for our product how it will be helpful for us so here let us look at the very first point where we are saying successful and effective planning see in business it is very much known to us we need to plan out our activities because we are doing it for the future and planning is one function which helps you to bridge your gap between where you are and where you want to go right so if you want to move into the right direction it is very important for you to plan out your activities and planning actually based on the certain questions if you do not have the answer of those questions then there will be difficult for you to plan out your activities so demand forecasting is basically helping the manager to plan out their activities in a better manner because this will help you to understand the future demand of your commodity right and if you are clear with the future demand of your commodity you will be able to make your planning successful as well as effective accordingly you will make the necessary arrangement accordingly you will plan out your activities so demand forecasting will help in uh, you know having a successful and effective plan for the business secondly we are saying production in line with demand that means you will be producing whatever is been demanded by the consumer right you will be producing up to that quantity right forecasting will give you the answer of uh, demand in the market for your product right so again this this will help you to overcome the problems of over production and under production like i said it over production is again a problem for a firm because unnecessarily your money gets blocked into it if there is no demand nobody will buy it right if good is of perishable nature then it will go waste and if the good is of durable nature also then you have to spend more money to maintain it right so this is a problem for the firm and again under production is a problem so to overcome this problem demand forecasting is helping us so that we can produce as per the demand in the market demand forecasting is also helping in the determination of pricing policy see price uh, made, uh, made on the basis of demand and we already seen the relationship of price and demand right price creates a lot of impact and demand also creates a lot of impact on the price of any commodity so depending upon the demand of your commodity in the market right you can keep your pricing policy right if you feel like that there is a lesser demand of your product in the market maybe because your competitor uh, or the substitutes which are available in the market are of lesser price than your product so in that case you can choose that kind of policy pricing policy where you can also reduce your price if it is possible to increase your sales margin right or maybe if the demand is good in the market you can charge the higher prices also depending upon the elasticity of your commodity right if your product is of elastic nature and people are demanding it more people are not changing their demand even if the price goes up 
so you can always charge higher prices to earn more revenue right so pricing policy can also be uh, determined on the basis of demand it also helps in the determination of marketing policy yes marketing policies are basically the promotional activities which helps in generating and creating the demand for your product right while forecasting the demand of your product in the market you get to know that people are not uh, aware of your product or maybe they are not known to your product so you can use various marketing policies and strategies to popularize your product or to market your product so that you will be able to generate the demand as well right demand forecasting not only helps in forecasting the demand but also helps in generating the future demand by getting knowing that there might not be enough demand in the market and what uh, policies we can adopt what strategies we can make to increase that demand right again financial arrangements are again very important for the production of goods we need inventories and we need capital as well right so all of a sudden you won't be able to arrange uh, the finance uh, if if you are not uh, known to the future demand of your product so it is always advisable for you to know your uh, you know demand in advance so that necessary arrangements can be done right because money is required to buy inventories money is required for running out each and every activity so finance arrangement is very important and that cannot be done overnightly so it is again very important to know your future demand of your product and then lastly we have evaluation of performance yes how they are relating this evaluation performance of demand forecasting basically this demand forecasting also indicating how you are performing in the market right your performance can be evaluated if your demand is good in the market that means your performance is good people are liking your product people are liking your uh, you know services which you are providing and they are they are appreciating your product because ultimately you are getting the feedback from the market right so demand forecasting is the, is a way where you are interacting with the people right finding out what will be the demand of your product and if the demand is not there then what are the reasons why people are not demanding your product and if they are demanding then what are the reasons why they are demanding right so you are actually also getting the indication of your performance in the market and accordingly you can make improvement into it right so these are the significance of demand forecasting we have discussed and it is again very important for us before uh, you know demand forecasting is helping the firm to have effective and successful plan it helps the company to produce according to the demand in the market it is helping you in determination of pricing policy what should be the right price for your product you can also determine the marketing policy for you know enhancing the demand of your product in the market you can make financial arrangements in advance and you can also evaluate your performance in the market because here you are collecting the data you are doing the surveys for the uh, future demand and which will help you to know your past and present performance in the market now moving ahead let us look at the criterias uh, what are the different criterias which are being used uh, in the selection of demand forecasting right so before we select any technique uh, there should be certain things which we need to keep into our mind for sure all of them are not possible to be taken into account for all the techniques but yes you have to understand that what is more important for you right so here we have written few points which will help you to select the uh, you know right demand forecasting for your uh, firm or for your product you can say the first is the accuracy definitely we should be choosing that method or that technique which is capable of providing you the accurate result because that is done for the future and future is always uncertain say you have forecasted the demand but there is no accuracy in that uh, you know forecasted demand then definitely you won't be able to plan successfully you won't be able to plan effectively because that data is not accurate right so if the data will not be accurate then your uh, decisions made on that data or the plan made on that available data will be waste right so again one method the method which you are going to select you should be sure enough that this method is going to give you an accurate result second is simplicity and ease of comprehend sure uh, now uh, you know good enough to choose that method which is simple to administer right if you'll choose some method of uh, forecasting the demand forecasting which is very complex right where you are not able to understand how to uh, you know take up this method or to go further with this method then there will be a problem for you right so one should choose that method which is simple to understand and easy to comprehend 
so that you will be able to draw the results and conclusions from it. Okay. Then the third is economical for sure, cost always plays a very important role because all these techniques are not uh, you know be done without involving the cost, w whatever the way you are going to choose your cost will be involved. So, depending upon your budget how economical for you this method is, whether you will be able to go ahead with this method. Suppose there is a small company and the method which you have chosen involves a lot of money. So, the benefit which it is going to provide you is lesser and the cost which is going to involve in the calculation of uh, demand will be higher. So, again it will be of no use. So, cost plays a very important role while choosing the method because some of the methods involves higher cost and some of the methods are there which involves lesser cost. So, accordingly you have to make a decision. Then reliability, whether you rely on that technique or not, right? If you yourself is not relying uh, on the technique, then it will be difficult for you to plan uh, on the basis of the results which you are going to draw on or make decisions on that basis. Flexibility need to be there for sure, right? Because we are doing it for the future and future is always uncertain, right? So, you never know what kind of changes you need to make, okay? So, your method or technique should be flexible enough if you want to incorporate certain things into it in future, then definitely you can add to it. Okay, there should not be any kind of a rigidity. Then practical ability is uh, again a very important aspect. Uh, you would be able to uh, choose that method which is practical enough, which is universally accepted, right? Any method which you have, uh, you know, taken up, which is not known to anybody and it's, it does not have any practical implication then it will be of no use. So, practical implication of that method or technique needs to be there. Maintenance of timeliness, yes, while choosing a technique, we need to understand for what period of time, like we have already seen categorization based on the time should be known to us. There are methods which helps you to give you result in a shorter period of time and there are methods which gives you result in a longer period of time, right? So, for what period of time you are focusing, suppose you are focusing on a shorter forecasting or shorter period of time and you have chosen the method which will give you a result in a longer period of time, then again it will be of no use. So, you need to understand your categorization and accordingly you will be choosing the technique. And lastly, availability of data. Suppose you, uh, there are different ways of calculating the demand forecasting. Some methods based on your past and previous data, right? If the data is not available to you, then the implication or implying those techniques will be a problem to you, right? So, you have to see that whether the data is available to you or not for uh, making those techniques and methods possible for you, right? So, these are some criterias which we need to take into account before we select the forecasting technique. Like I said, it is not possible for us to, uh, you know, keep into consideration all of them at one instant. Suppose for me economical consideration is very important and for me the availability of data as well as timeliness is very important. So, I will be choosing that method where I would be able to maximize my satisfaction with these criteria, but definitely I would be uh, focusing more on the economical aspect time as well as availability of data aspect. So, that depends upon you which criteria you will be choosing for selecting the demand forecasting technique. Now, let us look at the steps involved in demand forecasting. These are some steps uh, written here, how we are going to start up with the demand forecasting technique. First, what we need to do is we need to identify the objective, right? For what purpose are we forecasting the demand, right? The categorization which we have studied initially. We are forecasting the demand uh, at individual level, at firm level, right, at industry level, for what type of product we are forecasting the demand. So, this is very important. What is your objective? For what purpose you are forecasting the demand, right? Are you focusing on starting up a new product uh, unit, right, or you are increasing the size of your existing unit? So, whatever the consideration is there, you need to focus on it. Right, so objective need to be very much clear to you before you start with the demand forecasting. Then you will look at the nature as well as the market, right? What is the nature of your product? Whether it is a capital good or it is a consumer good because your orientation will be different, your target audience will be different from whom you are going to collect the data, right? And what are the market conditions? Okay, mark, different markets are there, different type of competitions are there. So what is the present market condition? that you have to uh, see there. 
then you have also have to choose the determinants of demand what are the factors which will affect the demand of that particular commodity right though there are different determinants but the product for which you are forecasting what are the variables which are going to affect the demand of that commodity and how you are going to establish the relationship amongst them then you have to analyze them analyze those factors the factors which you have studied you have to analyze those factor and their impact how many of those determinants are the prominent one and how many of them are not going to affect much of your demand so that analysis has to be made then you will choose a technique a method of forecasting the demand according to your requirement right what is your objective what kind of product it is what are the factor which is going to affect the demand so accordingly you'll make a choice of technology and then finally you are going to test the accuracy whether you are able to get the accurate result from that technique or not and then finally you are going to uh, you know do your demand forecasting initially you do a kind of a pilot testing you can say to know the accuracy of that method and if you are getting the accurate result you can go ahead further with that method okay so these are the steps which we need to follow while forecasting the demand so let's start with the techniques of demand forecasting so far we have seen what demand forecasting is uh, how we are going to categorize the different categories while forecasting the demand what is the importance of demand forecasting how we are going to go ahead with the demand forecasting right so all these things we have discussed but now let us look at the most important aspect where we are going to talk about the techniques the methods which are available there for forecasting the demand so here you can see we have made the categorization into two parts some of the techniques are qualitative in nature right which are also been called as subjective methods of demand forecasting and the others are your quantitative uh, methods of demand forecasting and how do we differentiate between qualitative and quantitative methods see these qualitative methods are based on opinion and survey right usually what we do is in these methods we take the opinion we take the opinion of consumer we take the opinion of the experts we ask them to fill out certain question as we take their feedback so these are the methods which are based on opinion surveys and question are and usually been do, uh, done for the new product in the market where we do not have the past data whereas quantitative methods are those methods where we uh, usually go ahead where we are having the past data and that is based on equations and mathematical tools economic tools uh, we apply for these methods so here we have five methods which are going to be discussed under this qualitative aspect we have consumer opinion method sales force composite method expert opinion method market simulation and test marketing so these are the five techniques we are going to un, uh, study under this qualitative technique and uh, we have four techniques here for quantitative methods trend projection smoothing technique barometric and econometric right so let us start with the very first technique where we are going to start with the consumer opinion survey now you can again look at the name of this method consumer opinion survey what we are going to do simply we are going to take the opinion from the consumer with that believe that because consumer is the ultimate person who is going to consume that product so he or she is a better person to know the demand of that commodity so consumer opinion survey uh, here the buyers are asked about their future buying intention of the product you directly reach out to the consumer you give them certain question as you ask them certain questions you uh, conduct it in the form of interviews also so you you basically try to find out their behavior pattern for that specific product what will be their demand for that commodity in future right and survey can be done in two ways right whatever the survey you are doing you can do it in two ways you can use the census method and you can also go ahead with the sample method now how are we differentiating between these two method census uh, census method involve containing each buyer whosoever is the consumer of your product you go and ask each of them about uh, their buying habits for that specific product in future but it is very time consuming costly and often not desirable because that is not possible right if you want to uh, go to ask each and every consumer of your product 
that is actually not possible. Census survey basically involves each and every person of your population, right. So, that is why it is costly as well as time consuming. So, what usually is being done is that is the sample method. So, what you do is you draw out some sample from your total population and you go to those consumer which you have chosen as an sample, you take their interview, you ask for their opinion, right, about their future buying behavior, right. So, this basically is a less time consuming way of calculating the data from the consumer. So, it involves survey only of a representative uh, sample, right, but again you need to be very careful while choosing the sample, those sample should be uh, the representative of your total population. So, this basically help you in the reduction of cost as well as time, however care should be taken that the sample are the representative of the universe, that is what I have told you, right, while making a choice of a sample, you have to be very careful that whosoever you are going to ask should represent your total population. It should not be done on the basis of your convenience like you have to ask only 4 or 5 people or maybe the 10 or 20 people who are nearby you have not taken the pain of going anywhere and asking the people, right. So, that would not give you that is definitely not going you the right results. Okay. So, this is one way of collecting the uh, data about your demand asking from your consumer directly that which is called as consumer opinion survey. Now, let us look at the merits and demerits of this method, right. There are certain advantages of conducting uh, the you know survey directly from the consumer and there are also some disadvantages associated to it which are called as demerit. So, first merit says that this method is simple to administer and comprehend, there is no complexity, you are going to the customer directly, simply you are asking them the questions regarding their future buying intentions. So, this is very uh, you know a simple way of asking uh, your people, right. So, this method is simple. Secondly, you are also believing that the results which you are going to get are realistic one because they are directly based on the opinion of your buyer, you are asking the people who are consuming it. So, they are real, uh, they, the results are more realistic and this is again uh, suitable for the short term decision. Yes, again these methods are suitable for the short term decision because consumer are not in the position. Suppose if somebody comes and asks you what will be your buying behavior or would you like to purchase this specific product after 2 years or maybe after 5 years. So, you might not be able to answer it because taste and preference of the consumers also changes, they never remain same. Okay, they, they might changes. So, it, this method is basically good for collecting the data for the shorter period of time regarding the product and the promotion of your commodity, which is not uh, you know possible for you to collect data for the longer run with this method, right. Now, looking at the demerits of this method, we are saying surveying is again a expensive proposition both in terms of uh, resource and time, you have to visit to the consumer, you have to collect the data, you have to give time to each and every consumer. So, this is a time consuming way, ok. Like I said, this is unsuitable for the long term forecasting because that is not possible for the consumer to tell you about their future buying intentions. And sometimes buyer may not often uh, you know divulge their real buying intention that is also possible. Though we uh, conduct this consumer opinion survey based on the uh, assumption that the results which we are going to get will be the realistic one, but sometimes buyers are not uh, telling their true buy intention ok, because they are in hurry because they do not want to give you the right opinion whether they are not clear about the future purchases of their product. So, they, they just say they might be saying yes also, no also to your questions. So, they, they might not be giving you the correct responses sometimes. So, this can also be an disadvantage associated to this method. And again the important disadvantage is investors biasness regarding the choice of sample. Like I said sensor survey is not possible. So, usually people go for the sample survey, but the sample which you are drawing out of the total population needed to be taken care of and usually what happens? The investigator choose the sample based on their convenience which will not give you the correct result, right. So, accuracy of result would be to a large extent contingent upon the quality of the questionnaire and the expertise of the interview. Right, these things are also very important because what kind of questions are you asking to from the people, right, what quality of things you are asking them. So, and who is interpreting those uh, results? So, uh, you know uh, the, the interviewer plays a very important role here in this consumer opinion method. 
So, this is a one way of collecting the data which is called as consumer opinion survey. Now, let us move to the second one where we have sales force composite. Now, what is meant by this sales force composite? This method is one step ahead of our previous method. Now, what we are doing here is rather than asking the you know opinion from the consumer directly, we are taking the opinion of those people who are in touch with the consumer, right. With that belief that because these people uh, you know are in direct touch with the consumer and they know better how consumer behave, what are the products which they demand. So, it is better rather than asking from the consumer because that would be much time taking task and uh, costly for the company. So, they uh, try to take the opinion from the people who are in touch with the consumer who are called as suppliers, sales representatives, sales manager, dealers, distributors and so on. So, these are the people who are in touch with the consumer and because they are meeting consumers on regular basis, so they might be able to tell about their buying intentions. Okay. So, Salesforce uh, like I said uh, and we also believe that these people have a better understanding of the market because they are into the market, they study the market. So, they might be able to tell you the clear picture of the market. So, with that belief we go with this Salesforce composite method. Now, looking at the merits and demerits again for the sales for composite, what we are saying again this method is simple to administer, right. Rather than taking the data or collecting the data from the consumer, now we are collecting the data from the sellers or the sales representatives, ok. So, there is again no problem, again uh, this is uh, uh, again uh, simpler than the previous method because these are the people who are known to the company also. Okay, because company have given them that kind of a distributorship or they have made their agent to sell that product to the customer. So, directly we can reach out to these people. So, again this method is simple to administer. Secondly, it is less cost effective also okay. as compared to our previous method also this is less cost effective because this will not involve uh, you know asking the opinion from many people you are not taking you are just going to the uh, suppliers you are just going to the sales representative which are less in number. So, definitely the cost will be lesser here and no additional cost will be incurred on the collection of data. The third point says that such estimated figures are more reliable since we are conducting this method with that belief that these people are having a better knowledge of the market and the better knowledge of the consumer buying behavior, right. So, these are the people who are always in touch with the customer. So, the figures which we are going to get from this method are more realistic one. Now, again we have certain disadvantages also. The first one is result may be questioned by the biasness of optimism or pessimism of the salesperson. We all know people have different kind of opinions, some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic, right. So, it depends upon their perception how they are perceiving the things and if you are taking the opinion of a person, right, uh, that person is going to give the opinion based on their perception, right. So, when we are saying that the result which they are telling us or the buying behavior they are going to tell about the consumers which they are in uh, contact with based on their perception, right, whether they are drawing the optimistic results from them or they are drawing the pessimistic results from them. Secondly, salesperson may be unaware of the economic environment of the business and thus may make estimate by ignoring impeding economic changes, right. Though they are into the market, but these people are not aware of the economic changes taking place in the economy. So, whatever the opinion they are giving, whatever the judgment they are providing, they, they might not be including those changes which are taking place in the economic environment. So, the results might not be very effective. And lastly, we are saying again this method is good for the short term forecasting. If you want to focus the demand for the shorter period, then only you should go ahead with this method. Again, this is not suitable for the long term forecasting. Here, I would like to tell you one more thing. When we have differentiated between quantitative and qualitative aspects, two things you need to make sure enough that qualitative methods are those methods which are particularly used for short term forecasting and we use these methods where we are not having the past data available to us. And if we look at the qualitative methods, usually all the qualitative methods focus on long term forecasting and 
we go ahead with these methods when we have past data available to us. So, you can see here uh, usually in all these methods we will find this disadvantage that these methods are not suitable for long term forecasting. Now, going ahead with the third method we have expert opinion method. Now, here what we are doing? Here rather than taking the opinion from the consumer or the sales representative, we are now going to take the opinion of the experts, right? People who are having expertise knowledge into that area, we are taking their opinion, right? So, this method of forecasting demand is essentially based on opinion of the experts. They can be internal or they can be external, that depends, right? How many internal experts we have and how many external uh, experts we can approach to. So, that depends upon that, but yes, here sure for enough we are going to take the advice of the people who are having an expertise knowledge into that area. So, now how we go ahead with this expert opinion method? This expert opinion method goes with two, uh, you know, again two methods are there through which we do it. The first one is group discussion, right? Group discussion is a very uh, common way of, uh, you know, getting the advice of the expert. Here what happens, expert meet as a group, right? They all meet each other physically and they sit together and they brainstorm about that particular product. Brainstorming is an activity where everybody is uh, saying or giving their inputs regarding the product demand, whether the product will be successful in the market or not, or people will be liking it or not. So, they are sitting together, they are doing brainstorming and they are coming up with their knowledge, uh, with their expert advice, which is being taken up at the end and based on that discussion, the results are being drawn. Right. So, here one thing again which I would like to add here is brainstorming is a technique which is developed by Osborne in 1953 and this is a very good technique where people sit together and they uh, storm their brain to come up with the new and different ideas where uh, which can uh, draw some kind of a good conclusions. Okay. So, this is one way of doing uh, or getting the expert advice through group discussion. Second is known as Delphi technique. Now, this is again a method of collecting the opinion and this was originally developed by Rand Corporation at the beginning of Cold War to forecast the impact of technology on the welfare. And now what uh, is being done in this technique, what happens here we are not asking the experts to meet physically, but rather sitting at their own place, we send them some kind of a questionnaires, we interview them and then we ask their opinion on those questions filled in the questionnaire, right? And then we exchange those responses to with the other ex experts into that area. And finally, we will collect them and we will, uh, you know, assemble that information together, whatever is being given by the expert. And based on that result, we draw out the conclusion for our forecasting results, right? So, this is again one way where you can make a panel of your experts, which you have to plan out carefully and answer these two questions in two or more rounds and at the end of which an anonymous summary of each expert opinion is provided and then you offer the scope of revision of previous reply and group eventually encourage, uh, you know, uh, converges towards the correct answer. So, this is one way again through which you are collecting the opinion from the experts. Now, let us look at the merits and demerit of this method. The merit says that decisions are enriched because here we are getting the experience of the competent people, those who are having the expertise knowledge and the firm also need not have to spend much time and resources in the collection of data from the other people. You just have to call the experts and their expertise advice you are taking. Again, this is useful for the product which is new to the market, right? The product is not known to the customer. So, then in that case you cannot take the opinion of the customer. So, here you are taking the opinion of the experts. We do have demerits. The first one is you are relying more on the experience of the experts than on the available data. So, there can be a amount of biasness associated with it because whatever the results they are giving, whatever the uh, you know uh, opinion they are providing that is based on their own uh, perception, right? Biasness can be there. And secondly, in case of the expert people you are inviting, so there might be a chance of loss of data, right? Because if you are uh, finding out the demand for some new product which you are in planning stage of, right? So, if you are disclosing your idea with the people and if they will disclose that idea to your competitors, then your information 
will be loss right and that can be a big loss to a company. So, this again can be a problem with this method if you are inviting external expert for the same right. Next is your market simulation, market simulation is again an another way of forecasting the demand. What you do here is you create an artificial market right uh, which looks like a real market and here you will ask the consumers, the buyers to come and purchase the product right. Uh, a kind of a artificial atmosphere you create and you call the people so as you can observe their behavior rather than taking their opinion based on the observation how people are reacting to the price, how people are reacting to the change uh, you know packaging of the product or maybe to a new product where uh, you should keep your product in, in the market store. Uh, how people are demanding them. So, all these things you are observing right by creating that artificial market you, you ask people to come and uh, purchase the product in that artificial market and their behavior you are observing right. So, this is how this market simulation methods goes with so that you will be able to understand the buying behavior of the consumer. But again this method have certain advantages and disadvantages. This market experiments might provide you the information because here you would be able to directly assess their behavior rather than asking them you are assessing their behavior. So, might be possible you are getting uh, the good results and experiments are useful in case of new products again where consumers have not seen them before. So, this method is good for the new product if you are administering to right. Then we are talking about the demerits of this method. This method is again not good in terms of time and money because observation requires lot of time and to create an artificial market setup is a costly affair. And lastly we are saying it has been established that the people behave differently, yes for sure. The people whom you are inviting to buy the goods in the market are behaving artificially because this is an artificial market. If somebody asks you to purchase things and your behavior will be observed and you are aware of these things then definitely your behavior will change right. You might not be showing your uh, original behavior and the results based on the artificial behavior are not realistic one. And the last technique in the qualitative method we have test marketing right. Test marketing is a step ahead to market simulation. In this we are not creating any artificial market rather we are launching a product in one specific area right. We, 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 we launch our product in a real market, but rather than launching it in uh, the whole market, we are keeping it for test right. We are keeping it in a specific market for a test purpose to see and to look at the reaction of the people, how the product is uh, you know respond, people are responding to that product and what is their behavior. So, this is one way or uh, you can say and the best among all the methods till we have discussed under this qualitative method to know the uh, you know demand for your product because actually here people are coming and buying that product and uh, you know they are not aware of that they are you are observing their behavior because this all take place in a real market. So, test market is a method where you are testing your product in a real market. Now, if you look at the merits and demerits of this method, this is the most reliable qualitative method like I said. Again this is suitable for the new product and it is considered to be less risky rather than launching your product worldwide or to the whole area. It is better to test it to a certain uh, level and then you can go ahead with the production of that product. But if you look at the demerit of this method, this is very costly because it requires the actual setup. You have to produce it right to test the product, actual production has to be taken place and production to be taken place requires lot of money. You need to have a proper production setup then only you will be able to produce it even if you are producing it in a smaller quantity. So, yes this is a costly method and this is again a time consuming and specifically in case of durable goods right. If the good is of durable nature, so to observe the behavior of the consumer you require lot of time which is not at all easy right. So, these are your qualitative methods. Now, if we go ahead with the quantitative methods. Quantitative methods like I said are usually uh, the methods which we use for long term forecasting and where we have past data available to us. Looking at the very first method which is called as analysis of time series and trend projection. This trend projection method is basically used where we collect the past data and based on the previous trends taken place right. On the basis of our previous trends we are 
you know forecasting the demand for a future product. Now, what kind of trends do we have? Uh, these are the trends basically we believe that whatever happened in the past we, we believe that is going to happen in the future again with that belief we calculate this trend and what we do is we arrange our data in a chronological order of days, week, month, quarter as well as years right and there are four kind of trends which we study one is the secular trend then we have seasonal variation, cyclical fluctuation, irregular and random events. Secular trend means the trends which are taking place from a period of time. Suppose we have written here the personal computer may be showing an increasing trend over the year because people are demanding it and the demand for jute products are decreasing year by year. So, this is a secular trend which we are seeing that the demand for these goods are continuously increasing and demand for certain goods are continuously decreasing from the market because they are no more uh, in, in, in demand right. Seasonal trends are those trends which affects on the basis of season right. Some of the products are demanded more in one season uh, in some of the seasons and some products are demanded more in the another season like we have seasonal effect. Then we have cyclical effect because of the business cycle our economy keeps on changing right. There are different kind of a cycle takes place in the economy. So, based on that cyclical trend what happens to the demand of your commodity whether during that period the demand increases or decreases for your product that trend you understand in the cyclical matter and in random event uh, which, which causes due to the natural calamities or maybe because of social unrest, foreign aggression. So, if any kind of an uh, ir ir irrespective event take place or random event take place, so what happens to the demand of your commodity during that point of time you study it right. So, again with this method we have certain assumption. The first assumption is like whatever happened in the past we believe that it is going to happen in the future and each components of this trends are independent of each other. Again this method is simple to apply and it is a reliable method of demand forecasting. If you look at the demerits of this method uh, you know time availability of long series yes the longer the series of your data the better you will be able to draw the result but that depends the availability of data you are having. Right. If you are having longer series of data, the better results are being drawn. This method is not applicable for the new product. Like I said, we need to have a time series data for it and it is not possible always or it is not necessary rather. It is not necessary rather that whatever happens in the past will happen in the future. We are having this assumption, but that is not necessary to happen. Okay. So, this is what is your trend projection method is. Then we have smoothing technique, smoothing technique is basically used when we do not have a kind of a secular trend shown in our data where are some irregular movements or events are being recorded in our data. So, in that case we use this moving average, weighted average and exponential smoothing method. In the moving average we take the average, here are the formulas which are written here to make it more clear. In the simple moving method. Uh, math, uh, is this average method we take the average of the previous months or the years and we uh, make a kind of uh, you know average of those figures right to find out the demand of our future, uh, future may be year or future month. Weighted moving average here we give weight to the you know most recent data and in the exponential mo moving average we give more uh, uh, you know weight to the opinions okay the observations which we have seen in the data. Like uh, we have this example here you can calculate the moving average for the last 3 months you have taken the moving average. So, your demand can be 120 if you are taking it for the past 5 months then your demand can be 112 right and the last is your barometric technique. Barometric technique is basically based on some indicators right if you are having some indicators based on that you can indicate the demand of your commodity like it aligns with the macroeconomics and it is always less costly as it depends on the past data right. But if you look at the merits of this method the proper choice of indicator needs to be there then only you will be able to understand and analyze that data and this method is not applicable for the long term forecasting right. So, these are your qualitative techniques and lastly we have the limitations of demand forecasting. The first is change in fashion, fashion keeps on changing. So, whenever we are forecasting the demand for the longer period of time, it might not be possible for us to forecast it accurately because 
uh, there is a change in the fashion taking place, uh, which is a future implication and which is very difficult for us to predict in advance. Consumer psychology also creates a lot of problem in forecasting the demand because consumer psychology is not being clear, right? Then uh, uneconomical, sometime demand forecasting methods are very costly, which is not possible for these small firms especially to imply with. So, this is again one problem uh, which comes across the company's faces because of, uh, you know, large amount of cost involved to it. Then we have lack of experts, we are talking about expert opinion method, but we do not have uh, people here who can provide us the expertise knowledge and lack of past data is also there, right? Because we do not have the past data available to us, so sometimes you are not able to get the correct result. So, these are the topics which we have discussed today. We have talked about what demand forecasting is, how we are going to categorize uh, the demand forecasting based on level, time as well as nature of commodity. We have also seen the significance, what criteria are being used for forecasting the uh, you know for choosing the demand forecasting method and then we have talked about the methods which are divided into qualitative and quantitative, right? So, these are the topics which we have discussed today and these topics are being taken from these reference books, right? You can go ahead with these books. Thank you for today's lecture. Thank you.